Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to our July webinar. Uh, our topic for this afternoon or this evening, you know, depending on where you are, will be mindfulness of the body and hair pulling. <clears throat> so we will be talking about different ways in which cultivating mindfulness can actually help you cope with hair pulling. Somewhere midway through the webinar, we will also do a brief exercise so that you can get a taste of mindfulness of the body if that's not something that you've that you've done before. Uh, I've also opened a poll for uh, the August webinar. So if you haven't voted, make sure to vote. Uh, and if you have any topics that you would like me to add in the next month's poll, as always, write them down in the in the Q&A. When I finish the, my part of the webinar, I will stop the poll before the Q&A. And then, so if you have to leave, you will know what our topic for next month will be. So far, it seems that changing and healing, setting goals and expectations seems to be winning. Anyways, uh, let's see what our agenda is for this evening. So first, you know, as I always like to do, we're going to define what is it that we're talking about. So I will give you a definition of mindfulness. Hopefully it will be clear enough so that you know exactly what I mean when I say mindfulness. Because mindfulness has become such a buzzword, it has become very diluted. And it had a problem with clarity to begin with because of how that concept came to Western psychology. So I'm going to try to give you a definition that I think is very practical and very useful. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, why mindfulness of the body for hair pulling. And in general, what is it that you can get by practicing mindfulness? Like, why is it that you should make this a part of your everyday life? Then we'll do a very short practice session. I will keep it five minutes, maybe under even. Um, just because if there are many of you who have never done any sort of meditation, it might be difficult to sit for longer periods of time. So this will be just a flavor of it. Then we'll talk a little bit about awareness and what it means to be proactive and why is it that this comes out of practicing mindfulness. And we'll talk about learning and coping by using mindfulness. Afterwards, you know, as every month, we will have the Q&A. You can ask your questions in the end, or you can ask them as I go through the webinar uh, in case you think you might forget something. So if there's a concept that I mentioned that's not clear or something I say that doesn't make sense to you, or if you just want to share an experience that you've had, you're welcome to do that. And I will read, respond, and, and all that once I finish. So let's get started. Um, this blurry man on the left is essentially one of the great pioneers of mindfulness, at least in the West. His name is John Kabat-Zinn. And I struggled very hard to find a non-pixelated picture of him. I don't know why, but I don't think he likes having his picture taken. The definition of mindfulness that I use is his, because I think it, it's not the shortest one, it's not the simplest one, but it is, I think, the most comprehensive and most practical one. So mindfulness, according to him, is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So right away here, you see that when we talk about mindfulness, we're not talking about something, some new age or spiritual or religious practice, although mindfulness can be incorporated in those, whatever your religion may be, it likely contains certain meditative techniques. But mindfulness in and of itself is just a capacity of everyone's mind. So even if you think you can't do mindfulness, you can't meditate, you can't settle down, yes, you can. Because you have a mind, you're able to be mindful. Mindfulness is essentially an interplay of focus or concentration and open awareness. And, and this kind of continuous balancing act between the two. When we say paying attention on purpose, that means that whenever we formally practice mindfulness, so when you sit to meditate, there is always an object of meditation. So there is something that you meditate on. 
for our for our purposes tonight that's going to be the body but you can meditate on a phrase on a mantra you can meditate on um, your breath as most people do and as i do in my own daily practice um, so you can meditate in order to cultivate certain emotional states and so on but there's always something that is the object that is the center of your meditation because if we're talking about the interplay of concentration and open awareness your concentration has to be on something you can't focus on nothing right so there's always an object and non-judgmentally non-judgmentally is the most difficult part first of all because it's defined in the negative i don't really like it when people define things this way because it's not clear uh, it's kind of like when you when i ask clients so how do you feel and they say i don't feel good you're doing great and if you ask me what my name is i'm going to tell you my name is not mike how informative is that so what he means by non-judgmentally uh, doesn't mean that you're not going to judge anything that happens because as long as you're awake you're probably going to have an opinion on something it means that you're not going to call yourself names or stick to any labels while you meditate. So that's basically what it means. Non-judgmentally means with acceptance. Whatever shows up in meditation, pleasant, unpleasant, painful, horrible, it's all welcome. And we're supposed to look at each and every one of these things. So meditation is also a way for us to get to know ourselves. And this is a, an aspect of mindfulness that we will heavily rely on when we work with mindfulness and hair pulling. The shortest thing, way to put it, and I'm also paraphrasing him, it's the feeling of what happens now. That's mindfulness. Uh, I didn't put this in, in any of the slides. No, I didn't. But uh, in, in Sanskrit, I believe, or in Pali, I'm not sure which one of these two, Usually I'm sure, but now because I'm talking about it, I'm not sure. Uh, mindfulness, is, is the word for mindfulness is sati, and it means remembering. So remembering where you are, remembering what you're thinking, remembering what you're feeling, and so on. And I really like this. Because when you say just sit in the present moment, it makes it sound so vague, but remembering what you're feeling means that we usually, it kind of implies that we usually space out and we're not really present. We, we forget where we are. So you can think of mindfulness as remembering your own experience. One way I was looking for different ways to simplify this further, because like I said, the more popular mindfulness gets, the more watered down it becomes. And I really don't like these vague definitions. And so I started thinking about what is it that, that I think would be the most useful product of practicing mindfulness for you. And what occurred to me is, was equanimity. So when you practice mindfulness for a long time, you develop a kind of stability of attention. And then you can very carefully balance out that interplay that I mentioned between awareness and attention. That means that when you meditate, you're not going to not have thoughts. If you meditate on a certain part of your body, thoughts will come and go. That would be the awareness part. But the focus will be on, let's say, your leg, if you're meditating on a specific part of your body. So that way you get both, and then you just kind of have to adjust them to see what, what should be in front and what should be in the back. And that reminded me of an image that I saw um, one time, and I couldn't find the picture of that image, so I found these two instead. Um, I, I went to this little town called Noto in Sicily. So it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Noto, Ragusa, and, and Modica, these, two, these three places. And when you go inside the cathedral in Noto, there is uh, somewhere like on, on the ceiling on the left side, there is a picture of temperance, the Christian virtue, one of the cardinal virtues. And she's standing there kind of just sipping water from one cup to another. And I thought of that and I thought how that's actually a very good metaphor for what mindfulness is as a process. People often say I'm not good at it, but this is because they don't think balancing is mindfulness. They think not having thoughts is mindfulness, but it's actually this process of kind of 
tweaking your experience and seeing what's relevant, what's there, what comes in, what goes out. That's what mindfulness is about. So instead of that picture, I actually find, found a photograph that I took, but the angle's horrible, so it's useless. I found two other temperance paintings. The one on the left is actually from the first tarot deck ever found, which I discovered in a random tangent looking for temperance images. It's attributed to Bonifacio Bembo, an Italian Renaissance painter. And then the one on the left is also a Renaissance painting. But you see, that, that's the point, just kind of from awareness to focus. That's what we do when we're being mindful. And we do that in a calm way, hence temperance. So you might ask, what is it that I get if I do this? Like you might, might understand what mindfulness is now, but the legitimate question is, why should I bother with this? So here are some evidence-based um, benefits of practicing mindfulness. So all of these have studies backing them up. There's a lot more that you find, especially in Buddhist textbooks about what mindfulness can do for you. Uh, but these are, these are some things that, that research has proven for now. So that's what we'll stick to. It decreases your reactivity to stress. This is terribly important for everyone who pulls considering that stress is one of the most common triggers. It improves your emotional regulation. Uh, what mindfulness does um, is kind of acts through neuroplasticity in the long run. So that means you have to practice for a long time. And it kind of changes the connections that we have between the prefrontal cortex. So that would be the part of the brain behind your, uh, behind your eyes or under your eye, above your eyes rather and your amygdala. That means that what you get is more conscious control over your emotional responses. That doesn't mean that you choose what you feel. We humans simply cannot do that. But it does mean that you get to consciously decide how to react. If you remember some of my older webinars, or if you've been uh, in the program or you are in the program, then you probably know that one of the the more common mechanisms in which that maintain and generate hair pulling is avoiding emotions. So improved emotional regulation can be also very helpful. It can help with PTSD. Although I did put this kind of strange like attention sign is because if you've experienced a trauma, you're probably fine doing mindfulness. But if you have diagnosed PTSD, so not just experiencing an adverse event, but having the actual diagnosis of PTSD prescribed, prescribed, diagnosed by a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist or a psychologist, then you can also benefit really very much. You just have to be very careful about how you introduce mindfulness. Mindfulness is in general something that we can all practice alone. But in this case, you might benefit from finding a teacher. And when I say finding a teacher, I mean someone who knows psychology as well as mindfulness. Uh, there's a, actually there's a book and it's somewhere here. So there's a book called uh, Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness. So this is something that you can also use to guide yourself if you want. There's another book about PTSD, but I have it on my Kindle, which is not in this room right now. Another benefit is that it refines proprioception. So this sounds very fancy, but it's really just a very common experience. Proprioception means the feeling of what's happening in your own body. Proprio means your own and inception, you know, from perception. So that means that you know where your hand is, that you know where your leg is, and how your, I don't know, what happens in your chest and so on. So that's what proprioception is. It's awareness of your own body. Uh, in fact, there, there was a study that I, that I read and once before, I don't know which webinar was it because I do webinars all over the place, not just for trick stop. Um, I talked about this actually, there is a study that shows that practicing mindfulness for longer than eight weeks regularly and daily for about 20 minutes will actually produce visible changes in your gray matter. So when you take an MRI before and after, you can actually measure the difference 
because that's how well it works with neuroplasticity. And for proprioception, it actually affects a part of our brain that we call insula. Insula means island on, in Latin. And the reason why it's called insula is because you can't really see it from the surface. So it's gray matter, but you don't actually see it in the surface of the brain. Instead, you kind of have to, you know how you have this, something called a temporal sulcus, doesn't matter. But anyway, you have to kind of move the surface of the brain and then you see the insula. And insula helps you with proprioception and it becomes visibly thicker when you practice mindfulness which means that you know what's happening in your body at every given to any given moment. And you're, you kind of, you're, you're more sharp. And that means you can detect sensations that are not as intense. This is particularly important when you want to be one step ahead of the urge to pull, for example, because you notice it very early on. It will also help you differentiate between different types of urges, let's say, which then maybe require different techniques or simply symbolize different needs that you have. So proprioception, incredibly important. I mean, not to mention that we could not walk properly without it. So it also improves mood. This is something that we've known for a long time. It affects general health, including blood pressure. So if you have mildly elevated blood pressure. So I'm not talking about malignant hypertension. I'm talking about incipient or like the, the early stages of hypertension. Mindfulness can actually help you lower your blood pressure. Although if you ask me, you're not going to rely just on that. You will use it in addition to medication. It cultivates patience. And I will come back to this point again, because I think this is an incredibly important point. When people want to stop pulling, and this is this basically happens with every other client who joins Trick Stop. They will say, I just want to do it now, immediately, like yesterday, if possible. Can I finish the whole program in two days? You know, sure, but you're not going to benefit from it. So change has its own pace and cultivating patience actually makes us more efficient at changing because sometimes when we rush to change as to, to change faster and faster, we're just kind of generating failures and frustration. And so we're taking ourselves away from change instead of towards it. It has a positive impact on academic success because, because it helps you, you're less anxious, you're less stressed, which means that it boosts your performance. And also there's a kind of cognitive clarity that comes with it. I'm not sure sort of what it does to your cognitive skills because I've read papers that say either way. It boosts your res resilience to stress or adverse events that you might experience. And it, it increases self-compassion. This is, again, one of those points that are particularly important. And I would like it very much if we would dedicate one of the webinars to this topic specifically. However, since it's been there in the polls, you don't seem very interested in it. But self-compassion is extremely important because uh, like compassion just means desire to alleviate suffering. So self-compassion is desire to alleviate your own suffering. If you don't have that, I mean, what is it exactly that you're doing in psychotherapy if you don't want to suffer less? So self-compassion kind of adds this extra layer of motivation to actually go through psychotherapy. So why mindfulness specifically for hair pulling? Its stress reduction properties lower the threshold for triggers. So in the long run, I have to underline that again, trigger something that triggers you intensely today might trigger you less so in the future, or it might stop triggering you altogether. When you don't have as much stress, you actually really don't have that many urges to pull. It cultivates a proactive rather than a reactive approach to our experience. A reactive approach is when you feel the urge to pull and then you immediately pull. A proactive approach is an approach where you feel something, reflect on what that means for your values, and then act based on your values, not based on what you've, what you've felt. So it creates this kind of, this little space between you and the urge, and then you're able to think through the urge in a different way. By boosting proprioception, 
like we said, the feeling of kind of what happens in our bodies. Mindfulness allows you to recognize urges while they're still in their initial stages and are not too strong to resist. So that means that you get some extra time to use coping techniques like competing responses or cognitive diffusion or whatever you're using and whatever it works for you. Because you develop more awareness, that actually decreases those mindless moments of pulling, that automatic pulling when you just kind of catch yourself pulling because you're more likely to notice your hand, for example, going towards your hair. That's a consequence of more awareness. And another, the last thing that I think is worth mentioning is that it helps us understand the psychology behind pulling by increasing our capacity to sort of open up and observe negative experiences. Remember, mindfulness is about sitting with whatever arises and if you have experience with meditation, um, you know probably that um, that all kinds of stuff comes up. I've been meditating uh, for over a decade, I believe about 12 years at this point. And even to this day, I am shocked by the stupidity and psychological garbage that my brain keeps producing. It's uh, before I used to think, am I really this kind of a person? And then now I think, oh, there's my brain again. But it does, so it kind of changes the way you relate to your thoughts, but it helps you get to know you because you start thinking about your thoughts and your feelings in more metaphorical rather than literal th terms. So you get to understand what's behind them. We do that for some aspects of our experience. I mean, how many times have you said to someone, I'll kill you, but the obviously, I mean, the obvious message is not I'll kill you, it's just you annoy me. However, when thoughts or feelings align with our fears, we lose this sense that our thoughts are metaphorical and hypothetical in nature. And suddenly, because they confirm our fears, we take them as something real. And mindfulness helps us divorce our thoughts from this sense of them being real. The way that we start looking at thoughts as, and feelings as well is as some sort of, let's say, transient mental phenomenon. So something that comes about, stays there for a while, and then goes away. And then you don't necessarily feel the need to react to this unless it actually aligns with your values. But if you journal, and then after every meditation session, you write down a few feelings, few sensations, few thoughts that you had, over time, that becomes a valuable resource to learn about yourself, about what your fears are, about what your needs are, about what your desires are, about what your taboos are as well. So it's, it is, it, it almost has the power that psychoanalysis has in terms of discovering sort of what's beneath the surface. So specifically, when we talk about mindfulness of the body, what does that mean? Uh, it's very simple. It's just being, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a mosquito that's haunting me and I'm trying to push it away without killing it because for some reason I feel sad to kill it, but it is annoying me. So mindfulness of the body means cultivating awareness of body sensations. So it's mindfulness just specifically directed at our bodies. We're not meditating when we do mindfulness, practice mindfulness of the body. We're not meditating on an image. So you don't imagine what you want to look like. It's not one of those new age manifestation things, right? So there's no creative visualization involved. You are not meditating on what you're afraid that your body might really be like. And this, for example, uh, can be a big problem when you do a body scan. And today when we practice one, we will start from our feet and then we will end with our scalp, obviously, because we'll go upward. And then if that's a place where you pull, you might be very scared to actually be in touch with that part of your body because you imagine that it must feel horrible. So mindfulness is not about what we're afraid of. It's about what actually is there. 
Is it quiet? Is it tingling? Is it itching? Is it hurting? You know, whatever you might feel. Is it pleasurable? So it is, it's about, it's about listening to what's happening in your body rather than imagining what's happening. And I think this is a very important distinction that gets lost in practice because our fears are extremely powerful. And especially when you're just starting your mindfulness practice, sometimes you don't even know that it's your fears that are guiding you. It takes a while to be mindful of them as well. And when it comes to imagining what we want to look like, um, I think it's also to an extent a cultural thing where we, uh, we kind of live in this world where people are told that they can be whatever they want. And, you know, as long as you just wish that this happens. And then people often, when I start teaching them mindfulness, they will often come in and say, so I'm imagining what my abs will be like. And I'm thinking, well, that's really lovely, but that has nothing to do with meditation. And also on another level, it can actually backfire the same way that affirmations can backfire on people. If you're convincing yourself of something that you know is not true, that will only create frustration because reality actually does not care about what we imagine. Reality just does its own thing. And it's up to us to find a way to conceptualize it, interact with it, but just imagining things isn't necessarily you know, going to do much. It's certainly not going to make us more mindful. So the focus is on the body, but rarely, or at least not in the beginning, the focus is not on the entire body. The focus is on specific parts of our bodies. If you want to, uh, there, there are basically two ways in which you can cultivate mindfulness of the body. What I'm talking about today and what we will try out is called formal mindfulness. So this is when you sit every day and then check in with each part of your body individually. There's also informal mindfulness. Informal mindfulness would be, let's say you're at work and you know that this is a stressful situation. So you find some time to just kind of go through your body, see what's happening in those areas where you typically accumulate stress. Let's say shoulders, chest, abdomen, like this kind of triangle be, uh, between your eyebrows is also a place where we tend to accumulate tension. So informal mindfulness would be to just kind of notice what's happening in your body as you go through your day. When I present these two versions of mindfulness, most people I know will say, oh great, I'll just do informal mindfulness. And I have nothing against it, except that I don't think it will be successful. Because in order to remember to actually pay attention to your body, because when we work, and if you're, unless you, you work, a, unless you have a job that's physically very demanding, so unless you're a construction worker, uh, it's very likely that you even forget that you have a body during the day. This makes formal practice all the more important because formal practice is just for you and your body or whatever the object of the meditation is. So my suggestion is, is that by all means, practice informal mindfulness as much as you can, but do that in addition to your formal practice. So make it like a bonus, not the staple. Because the benefits that I mentioned in the beginning, the evidence-based stuff, all of it is based on formal meditation practice. So sitting at least once a day for 15 to 20 minutes. You can sit longer, but this would be the time that most studies, I think, take into account. If you want to do informal mindfulness, you can do it right now. Just take a second and see what's happening in your chest, arms, whatever part of, the, of your body where you typically feel things and just list what's happening. So let me give you an example. I'm trying to see if there's a particularly reactive part of my body right now. Oh, there is my lower back. So are you, because I've been sitting all day, I've had a, an extremely long work day. I can feel a kind of tension in the middle of my back. And it's actually, it's like two plates pressing against my back. This is what I feel. So this would be informal mindfulness. 
just checking in. So that means that you just adjust your pillow or do something nice to alleviate the pain. Formal mindfulness is slightly more complicated. When formal, formal mindfulness of the body is called body scanning, right? So essentially it's, it means that you go through, you establish mindfulness, you ground yourself, you know, try to be as calm as possible. And then you go through your entire body by focusing on each part of the body. Depending on how much time you can spend meditating, you can go into a lot of details, especially if you go on retreats, then it'll be like spending 15 minutes, you know, feeling your thumb or something like this. Uh, in general, when I practice mindfulness of the body, my, or any kind of mindfulness, my sessions tend to last about 45 minutes each. And that gives me enough time to really go through every finger, every part of my body, at least for a little while. We're not going to do 45 minutes now, and you don't have to do 45 minutes in your, in your own practice. This is just something that I found that works for me over the years. I've experimented with longer sessions, shorter sessions, and I find that 45 minutes is kind of my time. So I do that in the morning and I do that in the afternoon. And when I, uh, the, the reason why I like 45 minutes is because when you start off, your body is still sort of agitated or excited from things that have been happening. And then you sort of start relaxing. And then there comes this period of almost bliss where like you, your focus is stable, you go through different parts of your body, everything's just lovely. And then around 20 minutes in, at least for me, it starts to become extremely difficult. And then this kind of becomes more and more and more and more intense. And then it just dissipates. And then you become relaxed even more. And the, the reason why I actually go through all this when I practice mindfulness of the body is because sitting with that tension and with that restlessness, sometimes even back pain, depending on how and where I meditate, this actually allows me, it's like the gym for your mind. It allows you to remain stable when you feel all kinds of uncomfortable things, urges to pull included. So by practicing this, this is like going to the gym for the urge. If you start practicing five minutes, let's say, then the next, next week practice seven minutes, like always stay one or two minutes more than it's comfortable because that way you're kind of building more resilience and more equanimity. So you're becoming stronger. And also remember, let me see what's next. Okay, so um, remember that there's no such thing as being bad at meditation. I hear this all the time and I never quite understand what it means. Every type of meditation has the same structure. You focus on something, you lose your focus, and then you refocus. You focus, lose your focus, and refocus. And in the beginning, this will happen very often because you'll be distracted by all kinds of stuff, especially if you have attention problems by default. But then as you practice daily, your focus will become stable. So this is something that slowly is being built but you will always have thoughts and you will always occasionally be distracted, especially if you sit down to meditate after a long day or when you've had an argument with someone because naturally your body will react to all this. So there is no such thing as being bad at meditation. There's being more or less experienced and there's having a more quiet or a more turbulent session. Don't ever think about yourself as being bad at it just think of it as, as that's what, what your experience is. So that's what you should be mindful of. So how do we do this? Different teachers will do different things. Today, we will do this. So we will start with our feet, then move up to the pelvis and abdomen, and then chest, and then head. So this is the shortest version. I call it the five-point body scan. This is the shortest version I know. And it's very easy for beginners. And then as you become more experienced, you can include other body parts. Uh, so you can include uh, your thighs, your, you know, your shoulders, your forearms, whatever you want, fingers, toes, all parts of your body. 
But because I don't want to frustrate you today, this is what we'll be going through. Uh, and then plus, in addition, I might add something that depends because whenever I kind of guide meditations by improvising them, I never really know where I will end up. But I do know that I will keep it in under five minutes. So shall we try one now? And then we will continue with the webinar because there is obviously more we have to talk about how this helps with hair pulling. But I wanted to give you a little bit of an experience with mindfulness before we proceed. And then you can perhaps share some of your experiences in the Q&A part. And then see, tell me if, I'll give you some tips sort of what to share once we finish. So let's get started. So make sure that you're sitting in, in a comfortable position. If it's possible, put both of your feet on the ground. In general, there are four major postures in which you can practice mindfulness. I most prefer doing it sitting down or if I'm extremely tired then standing up. So if you're very, very tired because people join from different time zones. So if it's like 3 a.m. wherever you are, just stand up. It tend, when you meditate standing up, that tends to be very energizing. I did that once uh, in like the evening and then later on I couldn't sleep all night. Anyways, so put both of your feet on the floor, put your hands on your thighs and just kind of gently let them stay there. Uh, you can meditate with your eyes closed or open any way you like. I prefer to meditate with my eyes closed because that minimizes distractions. Make sure that your back is straight, but don't be stiff. Just straighten up your back a little bit. Now pay attention to your lower back before we start and your shoulders, see if maybe you need to stretch or just move around a little bit so that you're comfortable. We're going to start with a quick breathing exercise just to ground ourselves. I'm going to ask you to inhale and then when I count to three, you will exhale. exhale. Okay, so inhale. Hold one two, three, and exhale. One more time, inhale deeply. Hold, one, two, three, and exhale. And one more time only. Inhale deeply, hold, one, two, three, and exhale. Now, focus on your breath in your chest, abdomen, or nostrils, and just observe your breath for a few seconds. Feel the air coming in and going out. Pay attention to what your breathing is like. Is it shallow or is it deep, slow, fast? When you get distracted, just gently go back to the breath. Okay, now would be a good time to start our body scan. I want you to pay attention to both of your feet, specifically to the soles of your feet. Try to feel them touching the ground or if you're wearing a shoe within the shoe. If necessary, press against the floor a little bit also. Just feel how firm the floor beneath you is. See if there's any tingling, hot, cold sensations. If possible, let us try to feel each toe separately.
now the upper part of your foot feet rather And one more time, just kind of press gently, press your feet on the ground. Just feel how firm and safe it feels. Now, move your focus to your pelvis and start by focusing on your buttocks. Again, those areas where they're pressing the surface that you're sitting on. When you get distracted, back to the pressure of the surface that you're sitting on. Then slowly move the focus inward inside your pelvis. See if you can feel anything there. Some parts of the body will be silent, some will be full of sensations. Whatever happens is okay. You're just observing, following, listing sensations. Now your abdomen. First, try to feel your clothes pressing against the skin. and then go inward. Any butterflies, moving sensations, holes. If there's anything particularly intense, focus on that for a few seconds and observe it. Just describe what you feel. Now moving up to the chest, again, starting from the surface, try to feel the clothes that you're wearing. Now inwards, feel your lungs expanding and contracting. See if you can feel your heartbeats. Sometimes this is also possible. Is there any pressure in your chest? If so, observe the pressure. Is it internal, external? What shape is it? Now just briefly check in with your shoulders. And if there's any tension, try shrugging them and holding them shrugged and then releasing. You may do that a few times if you like. Now your lips. Your nose. Feeling the area around your eyes. Now the triangle be between your eyebrows. See if there's any tension or muscle spasm. Your forehead. And then your scalp. Just briefly, see if there's any tingling or any other sensation. Make sure that your hands are on your thighs as you're observing this. And now, without frustrating you unnecessarily, go back to your feet and feel your soles touching the floor or your shoe. And then feel your scalp again for a second. And now try to feel your whole body at once. Just hold everything in your awareness.
See if there are any areas of particular discomfort or tension. Just list them. No need to analyze anything. Just see and describe. And now try to find something pleasant. Any part of your body that feels good, that feels stable, pleasurable, and focus on that feeling. If you struggle to find this, take your right hand and put it over your heart and then focus on the skin to skin contact and the warmth it creates or on your abdomen as well. And just be with that pleasant sensation for a while. Feel it expanding, amplifying. Every distraction, let go and then gently go back to the pleasant sensation. Now I'm going to ask you to inhale deeply once more. And let me count to three. One, two, three. You may exhale and open your eyes. Okay, so thank you for sticking with me. Um, if you like, you can share your experience in the q and I'd be curious to know, you know what it felt like for you. Um, were there any very active parts of your body? Were there any urges to pick? How do you feel now? For example, one thing that I always like when I finish a meditation session is that all the colors seem a little brighter to me and sharper. So just share your impressions in the Q&A and then uh, I mean, if you feel comfortable, I will read them, but will not reveal your identity. If there was anything that triggered you specifically, please also list that as well. So that then maybe I can give you a practical advice about how to, how to kind of avoid that. And if you like, uh, when our admins send you the recording of the webinar, I can also send you a few guided body scans as well of different durations so that you can practice on your own. Personally, when I practice it, I don't use guidance, but that's because I've been meditating for a long time. So I kind of have this, I have it memorized by now, but in the beginning, it's very useful to use guided meditations. So let's proceed with our discussion on what we can learn from mindfulness and how we can use that to cope with hair pulling. So one thing that it's quite obvious, I guess, to everyone is that our minds affect our bodies. If you're anxious, for example, your breathing will become faster and more shallow. Your heart rate will change. Your heart will beat faster. Your muscles will tense up. You will, your palms will start sweating, right? You might, you might feel something also in your chest or in your abdomen. Sometimes your hands and legs will start shaking. So your state of mind will affect the state of your body. This is one of the reasons I believe why mindfulness helps with things such as blood pressure, because you simply learn how to calm, when your mind is calm and clear, consequently your body is also. However, it's important to know that it also works in reverse. It's not just that our mind affects our bodies, but our bodies affect our mind. The way our thoughts, can cause us to feel things, our feelings can cause us to think things. So uh, think about this. The way you're sitting can sometimes affect how you feel about yourself. If you're slouching in a meeting, you're less likely to feel confident than if you just kind of straight up and, and look up, straighten your back and look up, for example. There are some theories in, in linguistics written by smart but highly pretentious people that sort of say that the way that we conceptualize and the way that we think about certain things actually comes from the way that our bodies are built. So the fact that we think of time as being ahead 
and past being behind us is a consequence of the fact that, that our bodies have bilateral symmetry. So we have in front and we have in the back. But if we had a different type of bodily symmetry, we might not actually be able to conceptualize time in that way. So the way that our body is structured will condition certain patterns of thinking. More importantly, the way that your body feels will affect how you interact with people and will cause you to feel certain things. When I was showing you how informal mindfulness can look like, um, I mentioned that I feel this, this pain in the middle of my back. And because I'm aware of it, I can mitigate its negative effects. But otherwise, if I weren't aware of that back pain, um, I might not be a very nice person. I could be uh, more impulsive. I could react angrily uh, because this pain would affect my patients, for example, or even it, it would even dictate how I see certain people. And we also create interventions from this. So mindfulness is one of them. By scanning the body, you are relaxing the body, but not because you're doing something with your body. It's because you're doing something with your mind. And then there's something called the progressive muscle relaxation, which is essentially an exercise in which you contract and relax every muscle group in your body. And what that produces in the end is also a relaxed mind. This is very important to know. Another example that might be important to some of you is that, for example, when we're depressed, that obviously is a mood, so a feeling that lasts for a long time. And then when we're depressed, we're more likely to see the worst in everything, right? Things are more likely to seem hopeless to us, pointless, meaningless, and so on. It's not because things are that way. Uh, it's because depression has this filter that it puts over us so we can perceive and feel only in specific ways. It's kind of like an Instagram filter, equally unpleasant as an Instagram filter. So progressive muscle relaxation would be uh, an example of an intervention that actually starts from the body but then affects the mind. As a psychotherapist, one of the things that I think are precious about mindfulness of the body is that we get to learn more about the nonverbal aspects of our experience, especially when you uh, CBT, which is most of what you know therapy is these days, is very much oriented towards the verbal. In fact, uh, a lot of CBT therapists will tell you that your feelings are just somehow irrational. This is not only untrue, but I think it's also um, I wouldn't say harmful because that's too strong, but I think it might slow down your progress in therapy because these nonverbal aspects of your experience, those that you cannot articulate with words, play a very important, if not even a bigger role. Think about the urge to pull, for example. That's not a verbal experience. In fact, it's very nonverbal and it dictates a lot in your life. When we focus on our bodies, we're actually kind of working on these non-nonverbal uh, nonverbal aspects of our experience, we're exploring what we feel, what we can sense. We're exploring these vague, murky territories. The reason why I chose this image, I think, is obvious because um, of Freud's metaphor of the iceberg. With mindfulness of the body, you're standing at the edge of the iceberg, looking down at the water and noticing the shapes of the iceberg below. So that, that's what you're doing. So by just observing your body, you're connecting to your unconscious mind. Um, this, as a therapist, is I think is an invaluable source of information because we get to learn the whys of pulling and the hows of pulling and, and why triggers trigger and stuff like this. I mean, Think about it for there are certain things that we always listen to our bodies for but somehow when it comes to the urge to pull then we stop listening to our body because it feels uncomfortable or intense i mean how do you know if you're hungry i, I i'd say most people don't intellectually say oh now it's i don't know 7 p.m so 
Let me see what time is it actually. Oh, it's not 7 p.m. yet. Okay, so let's say it's 7 p.m. Oh, now I have to eat dinner. Uh, that doesn't always work that way unless you have an appointment. Usually what you do is you feel something in your abdomen. You recognize that as hunger and then you eat. And in fact, people can be very specific about this. So sometimes you will recognize you need ice cream or pasta or I don't know, a peach. So that's, that's how we can listen, how carefully we can listen and understand what our body says. Like, how do you know if you like someone? You feel butterflies in your stomach, right? Or at least some people do. What does it mean to have a tension headache? It means you're under stress. So that's also a place where your body gives you a very snappy response. Uh, what does it mean when you feel pressure in your chest? If it comes from the outside, if it comes from the inside? What does it mean when your eyes become teary? You're sad, so you lost something or someone. Do you ever feel that kind of hole in your abdomen? So we listen to our bodies every day and all the time, and we cooperate with them in that way. But then when it comes to the less pleasant side of our experiences, uh, we tend to ignore what our body does and say it's irrational. I'm yet to hear someone say that feeling thirst is irrational, but everyone will say that the urge is irrational. But the thing is, is that we don't spend enough time observing, analyzing, following, so that we can actually understand it. So body is primarily a source of information. Uh, our bodies are, the, or rather, let's say the body sensations that we feel are actually the elements of the language of our unconscious mind. So to decipher or translate the information, you can't really Google it. You have to feel it and then connect it to your experiences. Some of the language may be shared, like butterflies you know, in the stomach or tears meaning happiness or sadness. But ultimately, each person has their own system of meaning of what each sensation means. So your body has its own dialect, even if it speaks a universal language, perhaps. Paying attention to what happens in the moment, what comes up and what goes away, in time will allow you to understand what these messages mean. This is exactly like learning a new language, but not when you go to a language school. Um, I gave this example recently. Um, when I came to Miami, I was already fluent in a few, a few languages uh, because I was sort of privileged to be born in a family where we spoke more than one language. And one of the, language, the well, languages that I was fluent in was Italian. And when you come to Miami and if you want to live there or just spend some time there, you will quickly realize that English is not always the way to get what you need. Sometimes, a lot of the times and many times you need Spanish. So I thought I told myself, so you're just going to learn Spanish. But because I work, I don't really have time to go to language schools and read grammar books. So what I decided to do is to use my knowledge of Italian and then just go out and improvise. So I go to the store and people will say something like hola, you know, que tal, or something like this. And then I will just start making stuff up. So in the beginning, they would laugh at me. Oh my God, how much they would laugh at me. But then I would learn from these mistakes and I, can, I didn't know how to laugh at myself. So that does help as well. But my point is, is that this is how I learned to speak Spanish by making mistakes, by making ridiculous, stupid mistakes that made people laugh. But eventually I did learn where it differs from Italian and where it doesn't and what is very specifically related to Spanish language and what, for example, has to do with the Cuban Spanish, which is the kind of Spanish that I like the most because Cuban writers are just remarkable. So for me, that's how it operated. And that's exactly how you learn the language of your body as well. You have to learn, you have to experiment, you have to make mistakes, and then you have to learn from those mistakes. It's like deciphering, I don't know, a, Egyptian again. Um, so this all emphasized the importance of patience. And 
as you know, I like to put an artwork here and there. And I tried to find, because patience is also one of the virtues. So I thought surely, you know, like medieval painters or uh, Renaissance painters must have painted patience somewhere. It turns out to be much more difficult to, to find than you'd expect. So I found this one uh, from the 16th century. And I think it's rather lovely. It has a lot of details. So you kind of have to observe it very closely. But you have patience portrayed as an angel here, hugging what seems to be a lamb, while there's, uh, there's this kind of demonic evil thing just lurking around, supposedly waiting for the angel to let go of the lamb. But the angel is just kind of compassionately, kindly, gently holding the lamb because it's not in a hurry. And I really like that as an illustration of, of patience. One more thing about patience. I like to quote Pema Chodron because she knows how to put a sentence together. She said, patience is the training in abiding with the restlessness of our energy and letting things evolve at their own speed. This is true of mindfulness of the body and it's true of psychological change in general. We kind of have to learn to follow our body's speed because our body will not accelerate itself because of our conscious mind. So we have to let things evolve at their own speed and then rush them where rushing is possible. The figure on the left here is Mara. Mara is a demon in Buddhist mythology, I guess. And it's a demon that tortured Buddha while he was trying to attain enlightenment. And learning how to ignore Mara um, was the key to Buddha's enlightenment, basically. So Mara would come and then tempt Buddha while he would be sitting, while he would sit and meditate by just offering these things, threatening, you know, bringing in doubt, saying, well, you can't really do this, or, you know, how about you give up your spiritual life for, I don't know, material wealth and so on and so on. And by sort of patiently acknowledging Mara's presence, but going back to the object of meditation, Buddha attained enlightenment. So uh, you fight Mara with patience. I like to think one of my meditation teachers a while ago was a Buddhist monk, and he used to use this metaphor very often. And he used to say, when you notice Mara, like metaphorically speaking, I don't actually see, you know, demons. Um, when you notice Mara, he says, invite him for tea. And that's exactly what we do in meditation. When we notice a very unpleasant sensation, we actually focus on it and try to observe it and be with it and see how it changes. Because ultimately, every single sensation that we feel and every thought, no matter how scary or difficult it is, will go away. So this is a simple, obvious fact of our experience. And this fact alone, if we remember it, tells us that we don't have to react. Even if we do nothing, it will go away. One of the important things about cultivating mindfulness of the body and applying it to the urge to pull is this concept of letting go versus clinging on to something. The core process of mindfulness is to become aware of distractions and then let them go. During this exercise, you may have had the experience of being lost in thought, right? That would be clinging, not conscious clinging, but clinging. Once you became aware that you're lost in thought, you're, you're already letting them go. And then you can gently return to your breath or your body, as the case was today. Letting go is also a slightly misleading term. The more accurate way of putting it would be letting be. Sometimes when we're distracted by a thought or a feeling and we let it go, it will still linger in our awareness. So it's not necessarily going to disappear, although many, many times it will. So we're not trying to change our experience when we're being mindful. We're just trying to stay with it. When the urge arises to pull, the idea is not to push it away because pushing away is also a form of clinging. 
because the more you try to push it away, the more power you give it, and then it pushes back even stronger. If you just let it come through, then it comes and goes, and that's it. You might learn something from it, you might not, but it's gone anyways. So learning the art of letting be is something that happens spontaneously, I would say, by practicing mindfulness. And in fact, in my opinion, this is perhaps the, the healthiest way to work with the urge. We do this and we learn this in the program, in Trick Stop, but at the later stages of the program. In the earlier stages, we focus on how you can react to the urge in a way that you minimize damage and then gain some control over it. And then once you, you, you kind of conquer that level, we move on to doing this because this is very difficult to do. But the ability to let go is a superpower. I think any therapist will tell you because especially when we work face to face with clients and then if we work with clients who have uh, let's say more complex issues to work with very often clients will see you in a certain way which is very skewed so sometimes it has nothing to do with who I am or what my intentions are and it's extremely important to learn not to cling to what your client tells you about you instead you need to let it be and then consider it rationally. So the art of letting things be is something that we as therapists should be able to master, at least to a certain extent. Letting go of experiences means watching them unfold and understanding them in a specific, a specific way as just experiences and nothing more. If you've been to any of my past webinars, you know that I like constructivism very much. And one of the things that I like to remind myself of is when something intense happens, I like to remind myself that this is just the way that your psyche is conceptualizing this. This is a construct. And sometimes I tell this to myself, this is the construct of your mind and it actually helps me, it calms me down because it gives me two things to think about. One, if it's a construct of my mind, there are other constructs that are perhaps more useful. And second of all, if it's a construct of my mind, I really don't have to, you know, fight with myself. So it helps me let go. You can think of what would help you let go. There are certain techniques in acceptance and commitment therapy that help with this. One of them would be thinking your mind. So when you have a thought like, I pulled a hair, so now I'm horrible, you would say, well, thank your mind for this thought. And for whatever reason, this act of letting go will usually dissipate the thought. Mindfully, you can say it out loud, the, your thought. You can sing it. I mean, I don't sing it because I think it would just make me feel worse since I am a horrible singer. But singing your thoughts out loud is also an excellent way to let go. Mindfully approaching your body and obviously the urge to pull means observing what arises how it arises and how it passes away. But it's not about acting on the initial translation. So the initial translation of the urge to pull is, well, pull. But if you observe it a little longer, you might see that there, there is something more there. There could be a deeper message. There could be a message that says, um, you're tired, maybe you should sleep or stretch or go for a walk. Right. So that would be a healthier message, a healthier translation. Being mindful means that you know that you're translating and then you can be creative and find better ways to translate. Mindfully observing the urge means seeing it as a set of intense body sensations that of course arise and then pass away. And if you're in the program and if you happen to be one of my clients, then you know that I will often ask you where and how something feels in your body. Because once you break up what you call the urge into uh, itch, pressure, this or that, then it stops being what it was before. So you've immediately transformed it into something else. And then each of these could actually contain useful information that will not lead to pulling, but it might lead to something healthier for you in the long run. And then mindfulness of the body in the end gives us some space to consider what a healthy reaction is rather than the impulsive one. It's what I was talking about being proactive. 
this is all that I have for you for this evening. And before we proceed to the Q&A, uh, I'm going to close the poll and see what our topic for this evening is, uh, for this evening, sorry, for next month is. So the topic will be neuroplasticity, habit formation and hair pulling. Let me see what's the runner up topic. The runner up by just two votes is changing and healing goals and expectations. So I'll make sure to include that one as well. Here, I'll share the results with you in case you're interested. So next, next month in August, we will talk about how we can, how habits reshape our brain and how we can reshape our brain to fight some of our habits. And actually, this is quite a good topic to build on because mindfulness is one of the best and fastest way to to play with neuroplasticity. So now the time has come for the Q&A. Before we start that, if you're new here and looking to start uh, with TrickStop, check out the coupon code for, for a discount. So let's start with the question. Uh, where can we get uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint? So you will not be sent the PowerPoint, but we will upload this webinar on our YouTube channel. So you can listen to it if you like. If you need a specific, it will be split in two parts. One would be just the, the webinar. And then the second part would be the Q&A. Because otherwise you get a very long video that no one has the patience to listen to. Um, so just wait for a couple of days and you should receive it in your inbox. Um, hello, sir. Um, I'm from Bhutan. I improved so much until this Corona pandemic hits us and isolation made me ruin my mindfulness and all. My question is that I pulled and it feels so much, sorry, just one second. It feels so much triggered. So I, so I couldn't, oh, the trigger is intense. So I couldn't resist and I couldn't sleep. Does impatience trigger us? Why I often feel like to see the mirror and I feel like I feel the need to calm my hair. So impatience actually does trigger, but indirectly because impatience makes you feel more anxious or tense. And then that tends to generate the urge to pull. And thank you for saying this because I forgot to mention this when I was talking about patience. When we're very, very impatient, uh, then our body becomes more excited. And because pulling often has to do with our inability to tolerate intense emotions, then it can make, thing, make things worse, not better. Isolation has hit us, all of us, like pulling, not, not pulling, it has been a struggle. And when it comes to mental health, I don't think my profession has ever had so much to do. So you're definitely not alone when it comes, when it comes to sort of feeling worse in isolation. What you can do if you want to practice more mindfulness is to actually create a structure wherever you are isolating yourself, create a small space for meditation, uh, and then just kind of structure your day around your meditation practice. So there is a way. It, I think because we're isolated, if you live and meditate in the same space, that is not very helpful. For example, uh, when I meditate, I have a, I don't have a special room for meditation, but I keep my meditation cushion right next to my bed. So in the morning, when I wake up, the first thing I do is just slide down from my bed onto the cushion. And I say slide down on purpose because when I wake up, I am incapable of doing anything that humans do, including getting up and then sitting down. So I just kind of fall onto the cushion, but I don't spend a lot of time in my bedroom. I meditate and sleep there and that's it. Even when I work, um, I work from one room. And then once the webinar is over, I will go downstairs and be in my living room. Because this way, isolation feels less isolating because you have different contexts. And even before isolation, I remember when I was just starting to work as a therapist and basically I had my, my apartment and my office were the same thing. So I would, at the end of each day, basically redecorate my apartment so that it doesn't seem like an office. Uh, we're, we're often very much affected by these environmental things and we're not even aware of them. And so 
embarrassingly, even though I did say I've been meditating like forever and a day, I, I noticed um, recently that noise affects me far more than I ever imagined. In general, I'm not a tense person or an anxious person. I'm quite sort of uh, laid back and I don't really, I'm just not very anxious. But I do have tinnitus, so the ringing in my ears. And sometimes it really bugs me. Uh, most of the time I can live with it, but sometimes it gets very loud and intense. And so one day, you know how internet ads read your mind? I found something called Flare Audio, this company that makes all these kinds of hearing aids, let's say. And so they have something that absorbs, that you put in your ear, and then it absorbs environmental noise. So basically what you, you hear more clearly. And when I put that in my ears, and supposedly it helps with ringing in your ears. Spoiler alert, it doesn't, but it is really nice and I like to wear it. As soon as I put it in, in the next couple of minutes, I literally could feel my entire body relaxing additionally. And as I said, I'm not even an anxious person. And when the, the, the car noise and my neighbors yelling and you know everything else that happens outside, once that was removed from my, from my awareness, my body just even additionally relaxed. And then I thought, God knows how many things, you know, like maybe my table affects me in a weird way that I don't know. So it, it is important to adjust your space and to change spaces as much as possible, especially when you're in quarantine. Could you show the book again? Oh, sure. Here you go. But it is upside. So trauma sensitive mindfulness. The author is David. Well, I can't read it. It's on the because I'm in the corner here for myself, but I believe you can see it. Okay. There's another one uh, that's specifically called mindfulness for PTSD. And I have it somewhere on my Kindle. So it's not in this room. It is a very useful book. And this book especially also talks about sort of social justice and things like it's, it's a rather interesting book. Can mindfulness only heal from trick? That is a tricky question that I don't dare answer. I don't, uh, that depends on why you pull, I would, I guess, and also how you practice mindfulness. Because first of all, people often tell me, oh, I meditate. And then I ask, well, how? And then they say, well, I play a meditation to fall asleep. I mean, that's a, perhaps a good way to fall asleep, but whatever it is, meditation, it is not. So it depends on how you practice mindfulness and why you pull. I personally, I would never put all my eggs in one basket. I think mindfulness is, is an incredibly useful tool for many things and research pretty much confirms that, but it's not a panacea and it doesn't heal anything, everything. So in that sense, I would definitely include mindfulness of the body because it is very helpful, but I would still be using my competing responses. I would still learn skills like cognitive diffusion or anchoring or grounding or breathing exercises. I would still use the TrickStop app, especially because it's free and learn more about my pulling. When you attack a problem from more sides at the same time, you have more likelihood of success. Hello, Vladimir. Well, hello. Um, I'm having trick for more than 20 years now. I heard all your webinars and I'm amazed about the knowledge that you're bringing to us. Thank you. Well, that's very kind of you and you're welcome. Can you please tell me if trick can cause lack of concentration, memorizing and lazy brain due to long trances and procrastination? I have noticed that I'm less smart than when I was younger. Greetings from Tunisia. Uh, well, I think we all noticed that we we're less smart than when we were younger. Um, actually, one of my clients mentioned that just recently, and I, I, I kind of thought about it. And I think the older I get, I don't think I'm dumber, but I definitely don't have those snappy, quick, judgy opinions that I used to have when I was 20 years old. I used to have an opinion on everything. It's like just literally in everything, you know, like most adolescents do. Now I kind of see things in the shade of gray 
And then I feel like I can't make up my mind, but that's just because reality is complicated. So we see it in a more comprehensive way. So don't think of yourself as more stupid. Just think of yourself as sort of being able to look at things from different perspectives at the same time. So that would be one thing. A trick can cause a lack of concentration or rather the urge can, because when you feel the urge, it does tend to draw all the attention on itself. And then whatever you do read or memorize or try, try to achieve, you will be less efficient. But you can also see it the other way around. We see a lot of patients, clients, sorry, in the program who struggle with attention problems. And ADHD in particular sort of carries a lot of anxiety with it because it is frustrating not to be able to focus on something or then completely hyper-focusing on something to the extent that you can't, that you forget about what you were supposed to be doing. So if you have attention problems, that can exacerbate trick. So you can pull more because you might have attention problems. So it kind of works both ways. And if you have ADHD and you want to start doing mindfulness, that can be very helpful, but I suggest you start with small doses. Okay, so these are some, uh, uh, some observations on the, on, uh, on the exercise. So someone felt shame when I mentioned the scalp. If you continue to practice body scans, what I would do is I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily stop at the word shame. I would see how I feel shame in my body. Is it my heart rate accelerating? Is it, um, I don't know, feel, feel, for example, when I, when I feel shame, sometimes I will feel like there's a lot of warmth in my body. So try to, to bring back everything to these basic, basic descriptions. And also you might want to spend less time on your scalp in the beginning and then just slowly as you become more aware of what's happening and then when you slowly, slowly, slowly increase the time you spend observing your scalp, observing, listening while you meditate, uh, shame will lessen and then eventually dissipate because one of the things that mindfulness brings is acceptance. I feel much calmer and less agitated, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Um, has anyone felt any urges to pull while you were meditating? I needed this, I love your instructions. Well, um, thank you. This was really improvised. When I actually have a script, I tend to be more organized. Um, I feel so calm, I almost dozed off a couple of times. This is very interesting and I'm very happy you shared this. So this obviously happens. I mean, it happens even to experienced meditators. I remember once I wasn't an experienced meditator at the time, but I was meditating for five or six years at that point. And then I was doing these, that was a period in my practice when I wanted to meditate as long as possible. So I would like sit for three hours or something. And then when I was intensely going on retreats and stuff like this, and then at one point, I remember uh, I was learning a specific technique and then I was reporting to my teacher and I told him that I fell asleep. So I was sitting, my head fell down at one point and, um, and I just fell asleep. And then I came to my teacher and I was very frustrated and I said that I can't believe that I fell asleep yet again, asleep yet again because that had happened once before. And then he told me, if you're that tired, perhaps you should consider sleeping and then meditating afterwards. So maybe that's what it is. Another thing that can happen, and this is why I liked your comment, is because when people are very, very tense and very anxious, when they start to meditate, it often happens that they fall asleep. So for this, I would recommend meditating standing up. Our body has built-in mechanisms, so you can't fall asleep while you while you're standing up i mean providing that you're not drunk or something so you will stay awake if you meditate standing up uh, and the reason why this happens is because if you're very very tense then your body doesn't know how to lower the tension slowly it just kind of drops to relaxation that feels like sleep so that could also mean that you were very tense before we actually began the exercise 
uh, have done body scans before, but haven't done where you find something pleasurable. It helped with an urge I got. Well, that's very nice to hear. Uh, um, trigger was when I put my hands to my heart too close to my face. Okay, so an alternative to this would be to maybe put your hand on your abdomen or simply just find, so for example, if sometimes my body just doesn't produce a pleasurable sensation. Unfortunately, my body is not a waiter that just caters to every whim that I have. But if I can't find anything pleasurable, what I do usually is just focus on my feet touching the ground or on my buttocks touching the, uh, the chair, or even I lean harder and then feel that because that makes me feel safe. The reason why I added that in the end, I wasn't planning on doing that in the beginning, but I thought it might be nice to actually end the meditation on something that will alter your perception of your body. When people struggle with anything that has to do with their bodies and hair pulling certainly does, then there's usually not a lot of love and appreciation of our bodies. And I thought if you end on something that your body does that gives you pleasure or makes you feel good, it might actually help you just plant this seed in your mind that your body is not your enemy. So that, that was the reason why I did this. The experience was really nice. I feel relaxed and I like the feeling of placing my hand over my heart. That was really pleasant, thank you. More information on this would be helpful. Um, okay, so if you want, I can send you some along with the recording when I send everything to our uh, tech team. I can send a few book recommendations as well because there are some very accessible and easy to read books on the topic. Um, I can send you guided meditations and um, I'm trying to think what else I can send. I can maybe even send some YouTube clips because there's a lot of free material out there. I felt my body getting hot, like the blood was flowing through my veins and felt the heartbeat mixed with the feeling of anxiety maybe due to the heat of the body. This could also mean that you were tired. So uh, when I say these things, this is just something for you to think, think about. I wouldn't really dare tell you what your experience is like. But for example, like I mentioned that I feel heat when I feel shame. And also when I feel extremely tired, I will feel that my body's hot, but almost like boiling water, like it's hot and very restless. So for me, I usually interpret that as being tired, but it could also be a sign of anxiety. In that case, when an intense sensation appears, what you do when you meditate is that you actually make that the object of your meditation. You observe what's happening with the sensation. That way you get to know it. So next time when it shows up, you'll be able to connect the dots and understand it. And also by observing, you're separating yourself from it. You're still experiencing it, but the sensation doesn't own you. So that's, that's something to think about. Uh, hand touch on heart and stomach feels awkward rather than pleasurable. Okay, uh, I would appreciate it if you would sort of describe a little more what you mean when you say awkward, because that word can mean many, 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 many things. Uh, and if you're still here, please write it down. And if not, I will tell you a little bit where I got this trick from. So. Um, I picked this up from Christine Neff, who is a self-compassion researcher. And she also has a book on self-compassion. She has these guided meditations. You can actually go to her website. It's um, selfcompassion.org, I believe. So self-compassion.org. And she has a few guided meditations there. And I've heard her speak a few times and she does recommend this very much as a kind of self-compassionate gesture. So. Sometimes when I see that people resist this and uh, hint it, I may have been one of these people. That means that you might actually have an issue with extending compassion and kindness towards yourself. I remember when uh, one of my old teachers, um, I, when I started meditating, I really liked, I liked body scans very much and I liked anything that has to do with observing the breath. So these very simple, clear, uh, secular, non-emotional, cold practices. And then at one point, uh, my teacher told me, okay, so you have a very good focus. You're obviously, you know, doing well. Let's 
kind of get you out of your comfort zone so that you progress even more? And I said, sure, let's do it. And he said, you'll be practicing self-compassion and loving kindness. And then I said, I'm just going to find another teacher now. And so we both laughed, but I felt an incredible amount of resistance because in the beginning, I think I didn't grasp the concept of self-compassion or even kindness well. I was able to extend it to other people, but when it would come to me, I would somehow feel like I'm spoiling myself, like I'm being this brat or like I'm wallowing in something. So to me, exercises like this used to feel, uh, I would feel just a lot of resistance to them. Like I would put my hand over my heart, but basically I would be thinking about my shopping list just so that I can get away from the feeling of touching my heart because it felt sappy and, and kind of sentimental. And then naturally, I have this thing that when I see that I'm resisting something, I become even more curious as to why. So I kept practicing it more and more and more and sort of reading on self-compassion and eventually that changed. But in the beginning, it was me being afraid that if I extend too much compassion that I will just give up on any expectations I have of myself, which really didn't turn out to be true. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I was able to achieve much better things when I wasn't hard on myself. Uh, I remember, I think I told this story once before when I was taking the, the medical boards. Um, and so in the, the step two, the clinical skills one, this I guess is the simplest, for most people, it's the simplest one. For me, it was the, the clinical knowledge because I had worked as a clinician before, so it was easy. But the third one, I was kind of afraid because what you do in this exam, you, you have, I think, I believe it was 12 patients who are actually actors and sometimes they have makeup. And then you have, you stand in front of the door, you hear this voice that says, now you may begin your examination. And then you go in and then you have to do a lot of things, take medical history, examine the patient, uh, talk about the diagnosis, type your report and all this. It's kind of like a very, fast thing. And I was afraid that I was going to skip some questions because uh, I hate being told what to do. So over the years, I've developed my own way of taking medical histories, and then I had to readjust and la la la. Anyways, I was very nervous. I remember standing in front of the door, waiting for that horrible voice to tell me, doctors, you may begin your examination. And then you open the door and go in. And I remember my heart pounding and I feeling very uncomfortable. And I used one of the self-compassion phrases that I use in meditation. So I usually end my, my meditation practice with either a phrase or a gesture like this. And then I just basically told myself, it's a very simple phrase. I just said, may you be well, may you be free from suffering. It was very simple. And for whatever reason, in that moment, my body was and my mind were able to just fully absorb that message. And it was almost like I took a sedative, like the rest of the exam just went, phew, it was very simple. Like it, my tension just disappeared. So it's, it takes a lot of work, but it, is, it does pay off. Guided body scans of different durations would be very useful. Okay. I can send you body scans ranging, ranging from, time, from five minutes to let's say half an hour. I think half an hour for beginners is maybe even too much, but give it a try and see what happens. I find that my abdomen gets tight because of trying to maintain posture. Is it helpful to rest your back against a chair? Yes, this is also something that you can do, but you don't have to. So this is very interesting. If this is how you maintain posture, then you might actually cause anxiety for yourself. When I maintain posture, what I do is I rely on my back muscles. Your back has a lot of muscles, but there are two very strong, long muscles down your spine. In, in, um, in Latin, it's called musculus erectus spinae, means the muscle that erects your spine. It's a very strong muscle. And the bones in your spine are very strong. So you can simply just rest on that. If you tighten your abdomen, what you're doing is you're kind of also tightening your diaphragm and that limits how much air can enter your lungs. If you can't inhale enough, then you will start breathing quickly. 
that will accelerate your heartbeat and you will become anxious. Hence, maybe you're doing yourself more harm than good by doing that. You can also do the body scan lying down, but especially if you're tired, you might fall asleep. So sitting posture is simpler. But yes, you can also lean against, against the chair. That's perfectly legitimate. I felt more peaceful after, but I also tend to feel guilty for spending time thinking of myself. I hope that makes sense. Well, um, it makes sense because I hear this all the time in therapy. The way that I look at meditation or any self-care practice, but my main one is meditation. For me, unless I am rested and unless my batteries are charged, I'm not going to be very helpful for other people either. You don't want a therapist who hasn't slept and who is nervous and burned out. So the way I see it is that meditating is not just something I do for myself, but it's also something that I do for other people as well, because then I'm able to be calm and kind to them. Otherwise, you know, it might not be the case. So maybe that's one way that you can reframe it. I would, so in, in general, when you feel guilt, that means that you've broken like a cardinal rule. So that means that you're not supposed to be thinking about yourself. If I were you, I would think where that belief comes from. Like, how does one even do that? It's almost like condemning yourself to live with guilt. It, I don't think it's possible. We shouldn't think only about ourselves, but I don't think it's possible not to think about yourself. This, this is very interesting. And I think there's a lot of useful psychological material there. Uh, love the meditation within this webinar. I never think of my hair pulling in relation to meditation and mindfulness. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I have a question. I have pulled my hair over 40 years. Now I'm afraid I'm causing nerve damage, arthritis, and hand pain. Any suggestions or references to look into rehab, strengthening, or other methods that may help? Frankly, I'm embarrassed to mention it to anyone because I don't want it in my medical records. So what I can tell you for certain is that you cannot give yourself nerve damage or arthritis uh, by pulling. Hand pain, perhaps, I don't know exactly you know, how you pull. So it could be uncomfortable for you. So I wouldn't connect these things to hair pulling directly. So you can go and get treatment for each of these without mentioning hair pulling. But forgive me for saying this, but I think all the shame around hair pulling might actually be preventing you from seeking help. So shame tends to maintain hair pulling. Can you say that again, the idea of letting it be, then it turns into a deep dive of pulling. I'm not sure that I understand. Uh, if I said that, then I lack insight into my own words. But I think if you if you mean one of the last slides of the webinar, I was saying that uh, instead of letting go, I prefer the term letting be because we can't really banish our sensations. We can just let them linger around, if that's what you mean. Hi there, I have been pulling for 19 years. I find that not only stress, but boredom will impact my pulling too. Do you have any tips on this? Yes. So I mentioned that I don't like the word awkward or the word uncomfortable. Well, boredom is on that list as well. Maybe we should once have a webinar, you know, on all the words that I don't like. Uh, the reason why I don't like it is because it, it's usually not a very accurate description of what um, of, of what's happening. From a constructivist point of view, uh, which is the way that I look at the world, I interpret boredom as a signal to change activities. It simply means that my, my body is telling me, uh, whatever you're doing now, I don't want to be doing this. Or if you're doing it, do it in a different way. But so that would be for me, I, this is why I rarely feel bored because uh, if I feel that boredom is coming about, I will see that as a sign that I need to do something else. Uh, let's say if I one day I find that I think my clients are boring, I would definitely see this as an invitation to change the way I approach psychotherapy or change careers. I can't imagine that happening, but in theory, that's how I would understand it. But what I was, go what I was going for here is that 
pay attention to what happens when you're bored. So what's the experience of boredom like? Because very often when I talk to people, when there's what, what happens when they say boredom is they will feel the need to change activities, but because they're tired, because of inertia, because of not understanding the feeling or whatever else, they don't do it. So what happens is that their mind will go on this kind of long journey of ruminating on all the things that they haven't done well or that they need to do, or it will just spin certain thoughts in circles. And that will actually make you anxious. So when people say that they're bored, very often they mean that they're very anxious. So it's anxiety that's actually triggering it, not just boredom. So that's how I would approach it. But in the most basic sense, boredom means do differently. That's how you can simply try. If, if guilt means you made a mistake, sadness means there's a loss happening, internal or external, um, if threat means you will have to reconsider a good part of who you are, if, um, you know, like aggression means I have to push this idea through, then boredom means I have to change what I'm doing. And I find that if you remember when, when I was talking in the beginning about how, how mindfulness allows us to kind of dive, dive deeper beneath the iceberg a little bit, that's one way to do it is by listening to what your body is saying. When it says, I'm bored, that means you have to switch activities. And if it's anxiety, as I suggested, then maybe do something that will calm you down. Uh, just want to say thank you for doing this webinar, even though you've already had a long work day. Oh, you're welcome. Well, the webinar was scheduled, so I think only death could prevent me from doing it. So. Um, I have a very strong super ego, as you can see. Um, you're welcome. It's always, it's always a pleasure. Would practicing mindfulness help to reduce avoidance, as this is what I find to be an issue? Sometimes I just don't want to be present. It's easier to avoid. Yes. So mindfulness is basically the antidote. It's the exact opposite of avoidance. Mindfulness is about being with whatever happens. So Yes, absolutely. But if you have, if your pattern of avoidance is very strong, then my suggestion is to, to start with smaller doses of mindfulness. So do one week, five minutes, then next week, seven minutes, then week after that, 10 minutes. And then week four, you can go 15 minutes. So in the program in TrickStop, I approach teaching mindfulness differently because mindfulness is not the main thing. But when I have, when I teach people mindfulness, like just mindfulness, I kind of use this approach where they will start with whatever is their baseline mindfulness capacity, and then we increase it slowly. Like the, in the beginning of this year, I taught this three month long course on self-compassion. And then the first month was about establishing mindfulness. Then the second month was about compassion towards everyone. And then third month was only about self-compassion. So I always take it sort of one step at a, at a time with topics, with techniques, and also with duration. Because if you sit and meditate for 20 minutes at a time and you've never done it before, it's not going to be a very pleasant experience. It's like, uh, it's like basically going to the gym. Like you don't want to start lifting 100 pounds if you've never gone, well, that's not that much, but you know, you want, you're not gonna lift some insane weight if you've never been to the gym before, you will start with something that you can do and then slowly progress. So the same goes with this. And then once you learn how to be with difficult experiences, that will also reduce the avoidance mechanism mechanisms. I was pulling as I meditated. Uh, this is very interesting. And I see the same anonymous attendee saying, I must go now, thank you. If you're not the same person, uh, tell me if you were aware of the pulling or not. I always feel empowered and stronger to resist urges after these webinars. I'm very grateful and thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy. That, like, uh, I sometimes feel unpleasant reading these compliments, but it really does mean a lot because uh, there's a lot of people out there who can't afford our program. Uh, and like, if these help, then it really does make me very happy. 
Is there somewhere you're sharing the meditations, body scans, and all the resources of the webinars? So yes, um, uh, all the webinars, like I said, are on our YouTube channel. Uh, you will receive a link in a couple of days, so you can go and check it out. Uh, it's always split in two parts, so Q&A and the main part. And as far as the resources for meditation, people who are in TrickStop, I just sort of share the links that I have with them. Um, because I have some uploaded on um, on a, how you call it, like a, this Dropbox folder. And then I share that with people. If you like, you can email me. I can share my folder with you. And I will upload a few meditations that will be sent out to all the webinar attendees. So you can download these as well and then have them somewhere. Please do send books, guided meditations and videos. That would be good. Thank you. I will make sure to do that. Just keep in mind, um, a very good friend of mine is very interested in mindfulness. And for years, he's been reading books about mindfulness, but he actually never meditates. He just reads books about mindfulness because they calm him down. So it's fine to read books. I, you know, I'm guilty of that myself, but practice is always more important than reading. Just keep that in mind. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, maybe I should replace the word boredom with idle. So while driving, reading, watching TV, all this will trigger me. Well, that also kind of implies that your body needs movement or activity of some sorts. Sometimes, like, I'm fortunate not to be that kind of a person. But again, a good friend of mine, she um, she's a therapist also. And her body is kind of always so full of energy. And she finds it very difficult to sit with clients all day. And then she goes jogging before and after work because that's her way to get all the energy out. So maybe you can consider doing something like this. But in terms of practical techniques, while driving, reading and watching TV, there's something very simple that can help, which is just wearing gloves. It's Most people don't like the idea, but it is very, very efficient. I would like the resources as well for the background noise. Okay, I'll type the the answer uh, one second because you can have the, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Okay, I copied your email address, so I will send you the link. I was hoping to answer right away, but um, but then I didn't because I'm very clumsy with technology. Um, do I have to meditate every day to experience the benefits you listed in the beginning? Yes. This is the shortest, for sure the shortest and most precise answer I can give. Uh, meditation is not, shouldn't be seen as a relaxation technique. It does have that effect, but that's a side effect. The main effect is to strengthen your focus and expand your awareness. That's the, what we're working on because that allows us to accept our experiences without reacting to them. Uh, if you want relaxation, you can use specific relaxation techniques. There's like a dozen breathing techniques that you can use. Uh, there are, um, you know, there's grounding techniques, there's progressive muscle relaxation. These will just relax you. But mindfulness is something that you do daily. So it's, it's essentially something that you build into your life. So it's, a, it's always a long-term strategy. In general, maybe mindfulness is not for you and that's legitimate and fine. It's, you know, nothing is a, is a resource for everyone. But I think if you're looking for these quick solutions that will just eliminate a problem forever, I don't think they exist. Like that exists in surgery, but even there you have pain afterwards. Uh, Think of any somatic condition. If you have high blood pressure, you always have to take medication. You have to take care of what you eat. If you have diabetes type two, you have to be, you have to exercise, you have to be active. You have to, again, again, you know, make sure to pay attention to what you eat. And the same goes for psychological change. Like the change that we're talking about is always long-term. If it's going to be sustainable, it's long-term. So that means implementing, um, implementing things on daily basis. So that's, 
That's very simple. I mean, in the beginning, maybe you can meditate three times a week and then add four times and so on. But it's it's much easier said, it, it's much easier done than you think. So for example, I remember when I first decided that I want to meditate daily, I just told myself, you'll just do this every morning. And then I did. Because my meditation cushion is, is kind of between my bed and my path to the bathroom where I brush my teeth. So I see it, it's there, I sit on it. Very simple. So you kind of build it into a routine that you already have, and then you're halfway through. So I think those are all the questions. Um, I hope to see you in August, and then we will be talking about habits and neuroplasticity and what is it that we can learn to help us cope with pulling? Uh, have a pleasant, I guess it's evening at this point, and see you in August.